Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. WTF is Gremlins Incorporated. This is a digital board game, and it's out of early access now. It's fully released, and it's by some of the developers behind a turn-based strategy title that you might know called Aeonor. I believe there were two titles in that series, and it's developed by Alexei Bukolev, Sergei Klimov, and Charlie Oscar Lima Tango Entertainment Interactive, or Interactive Entertainment, which would be cult e, I guess. One way or the other, they've developed what is built from the ground up to be a board game, but with all of the trimmings and the features, as well as the convenience and quality of life implementation that you would hopefully expect from a digital version of a real board game. This is not a real board game. There is no physical version of this, which means that they can design it in such a way where they can focus on the convenience of play and they can also think about in what scenario is a game like this going to be played on a regular basis and how can we make it easier for that to happen. The problem with a lot of board games online is that they either have a very small community or the implementation simply is not optimized for play on a computer. This game, on the other hand, seems to have got most of that nailed down. And we're going to explain why that is. And also, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I just find this game fun. Because we had a lengthy multiplayer session on the Co-optional Lounge. Myself, Dodger, Strippin' and Cry. And we had a blast playing this game. And I'd just like to tell you why that is. So, let's look at the settings menu here. Fairly basic stuff. Resolution options available. Uh, the only thing missing here is that it doesn't actually go up to 2560 by 1440 in a window. Minor complaint, but that's actually addressed, along with many of my criticisms, in their forthcoming roadmap for features and improvements as the game continues to get patched. So it's not like they don't know that people want higher resolution. They just don't happen to have it available in windowed mode. And I'd like to play my board games in windowed mode. Because anything that's turn-based, it's nice to be able to just quickly pop over to another browser or do something else while the turn is going on. Now, you have the option to go second monitor or primary monitor here. Now, the game misinterprets my primary monitor as the secondary monitor, which is a little bit of a weird bug. Most games don't do that, but I've had a few do it. And I had a couple of issues getting this into proper windowed mode instead of borderless, but it didn't take too long to fix. I just wanted to point that out, though. Outside of that, we've got audio settings, sound effects, ambience, and music. I will say the game is somewhat lacking in music. It has this awesome, funky, almost porny theme for the opening menu, which I think is awesome. But there is not a lot of music in the actual game itself, which is just kind of disappointing because the game has this really strong theme going on with it. And part of the implementation of a theme in a digital board game would be to have an appropriate soundtrack. And of course, if you don't have that, especially when your opening music is so strong and really gives this awesome vibe as to what you're about to expect, then it's a little disappointing. Outside of that, you've got a hint, tooltip, and a high contrast mode available. What is missing here, again, part of their roadmap is a colorblind mode, which will be quite useful because colors are definitely important in this game. And then you have language selections. Quite a few here, actually. English, German, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Czech, Ukrainian, Russian, Japanese, and a simplified version of Chinese. They don't have Korean yet, and I only bring that up because it's also on the roadmap, so... It's like, why are you pointing out a lack of Korean? It's like, well, that's that's why. That is why. Koreans like board games, by the way, if you didn't already realize. There's quite a few of them. I've, I have quite literally played Dominion with Korean pro gamers, and they were surprisingly good at it. Actually, I wasn't really surprised they were good at it at all. They, they're just good at everything game-wise. So, you have a full tutorial here, which is actually well set up. The only complaint I've got about the tutorial is that it's not voice acted, and that, that means there's a lot of text that you have to read. It's a little bit unfortunate, but... It's forgivable. And they have a practice session here. This is quite nice because it lets you play a full game against the AI and it prompts you during the game with various bits of information, which I think is a good way to learn a game, especially after you've read these three. These tutorials take about 15 minutes to do. It's not too bad. You also have a full rule book available here. So if there's anything you don't understand, you can easily jump into it. And this is readily accessible. And they also use graphical representation here, which is great. That's absolutely awesome. The only thing that I don't like about it is that it would be nice if there were hot linkable things in this manual. That, that's a very nitpicky complaint, but I'm talking about things like the uh, Civipedia, for instance, in the Civilization games. They're very much designed around the idea that you'll probably want to cross-reference things. The rulebook doesn't really let you do that, although there is a Gremlinopedia here, which will let you look through all of the cards. It also shows you the full resolution card art, which is quite nice. I, I don't generally see a huge use for this because there's no way you're going to remember all of this stuff, but it's nice to have it nonetheless, I've got to admit. All right, so what 
do you do in the game? And more importantly, what kind of legs does this have? Does this have the sort of longevity? Do you need friends to play it with? That's a big concern of a lot of people that buy digital board games or indeed simulators on the PC in order to play those board games. Will I have people to play with? The answer is yes. It's got single player, which is what I'm going to show you with the AI, and it also has multiplayer. Now, the multiplayer, as you can see here, is a lobby-based system, and you also have a ranked queue. There is actually a full ranking system in the game. They're even thinking about implementing some prize-based tournaments, actual cash prizes, which is pretty cool. So if you want to play on a ladder, you can. If you want to set up a custom game, you can. And as we found out when we set up a custom game, people joined almost instantly. And it also sort of warns you when you go in here as to when a new game is available. It makes a sound and says, hey, there's a new lobby, so you might want to jump in. You can also queue up for ranked while playing single player, which is a really nice little feature. What I will say is there's a slight problem with the lobby. Again, this is addressed in their roadmap, but it's not currently implemented. You can't have private lobbies. So that means when we set up for our session on stream today, what we had to do was we had to get everyone in really quick and we had to kick any random that joined. You can kick people and it, it, that does make it easy, but they can instantly rejoin. So it can be a bit of a pain in the ass to set up a private session with friends. And frankly, that seems like a very basic feature that was a pretty key and silly omission as far as I'm concerned, but they do know about it. They are implementing it. So I suppose I can forgive them for it, but it is definitely worth bearing in mind if you happen to consider buying this title. All right. So I've talked about the features. I'm going to give you one warning. This game appears to be always online only. Now, I was reading through their Q&A, and they were talking about whether or not the game would be available on platforms like GOG, and they said that it wouldn't because the game, even for single player, requires a server connection. That is unnecessary. I'm always going to criticize unnecessary always online stuff because, I mean, you can consider that DRM to some extent, even if it's not explicitly designed for copyright protection, it gets in the way of legitimate players. Now, why is it that I can't play a board game, a single player board game, without an online connection if I happen to be, say, in a place with my laptop where I don't have Wi-Fi? Or if I'm playing it on, say, a Surface tablet or something like that? That is a little unnecessary as far as I'm concerned. Again, I am going off the information that they personally gave in their FAQ as to whether or not you can actually do that. But... For the most part, I think people are going to be playing multiplayer, so they're going to be online anyway. This game does not have hot seat play, although I have to say it would be a little difficult to do that properly because you have a hand of cards that you generally don't want to be showing to people. So it's, uh, again, just a, a little unfortunate. Okay, so we're looking at single player, and these single player options are a set of presets, basically, with different goals. However, you can also customize it. So I'll show you the custom session here and how you can actually make this work. All right, so what we have here is a regular session type. It doesn't affect the ratings. Of course, it doesn't single player. So you have four goals. That's score limit. So get 20 victory points and win instantly. You can also change that between 10 to 100. That'll be a very long game there. Interestingly enough, the game even warns you if you go really, really long. It's like this session might last more than an hour. It's like that's, you know, that, that's an example of the care and attention that's been put into this. And I'm going to be pointing out numerous little features that don't seem too important during this video that show that this company, these developers, have a key understanding of the kind of quality of life improvements that would make a digital board game more fun and less of a pain in the ass to play. So kudos to them for that. I imagine their early access period helped that out quite a bit in terms of the feedback. Time limit. Again. I mean, that's maybe a bit unnecessary. Warning, this 120-minute session might last more than an hour. Really? Okay, thanks, game. Round limit, which is what we played. We played 30 rounds, although I feel that 50 rounds is maybe the better option. I'll talk a little bit more about that once we get into the game. And a turn time limit available here. Obviously, in single player, you can have low limit. No low... Eh, try again. No limit, which we will have on, so you can think as long as you want. I will say it would be nice to have no limit available in a private lobby because I, I don't feel the need to have a turn timer for people that are playing with me that are my friends because I'm willing to give them as much time as need be and especially on a stream we may be talking about something else turns are going to take a while so you can only go down to slow which I think is about like a 60 second turn or whatever in multiplayer and that's because it's designed to be match made because it doesn't have private sessions yet so again that's an omission that needs to be added and a weird omission considering how many other quality of life features we have here 
Chaos cards. So this is a set of cards that are available to all players at any time. They're very powerful. They're, they add a nice little spin to the game. Uh, they also put you in a position where you can execute some really cool strategies. And it also puts an additional competitive element into the game. Because once those cards are used, they're gone completely. So they can be stolen by other players. And you also have Quick Start, which is completely irrelevant for this. It, it just means you can start the game without filling up all the slots if you need be. So we're going to pick some uh, normal AI here. We're going to go for a four-player game. And we're going to dive right in. There we go. Round limit. Yep, it's all good. We're going to go for that. Here we go. Session has been created. Okay, so welcome to Gremlins Incorporated. So this is a game of the board, but it's also got a hand of cards. So initially, you're able to mulligan these different cards. I'm going to explain what all of these do once we get into the game, but I'm just going to stick with what they've given me here. All right, here we go. And I go first. Okay. You might notice the unfortunate lack of music here. There are occasional ambient sounds, but... The game doesn't have a huge amount of music in it, which kind of sucks. All right, so we have no time limit on, so I can explain what everything is. This board is going to... This is intimidating, isn't it? I think for a lot of you. You're looking at this board and you're like, what the hell is this? This is crazy. All these symbols, I don't understand what's going on. Well, what I will say is that while the board is initially intimidating, once you go through the tutorials, you can pretty much grasp what everything is. And it's a case of learning what each symbol means. So... We are going to talk about those different symbols and all that sort of thing. I'm just, I apologize. I actually had Flux turned on and I'm playing in a window, so I didn't realize it was going to actually make this game look a bit darker than it needs to be. There we go. There's a little bit more color for you. Hopefully you will enjoy that. Right. So this hand of cards, this is the most important thing to know about the game initially, because these cards not only provide the way that you move around the board, you don't roll dice to move in this game, but they are also cards which you can play in order to gain advantages. So... As you will note here, as I'm moving over these different cards, you're seeing on the board these little areas are being highlighted. That's going to show you where you can move to. So, for instance, I start right here. I'm actually starting on the jail, and I could play this card right here, Kingpin. This, as you can see, has a dice face in the top left-hand corner. This means I can move that many squares. Now, the advantage of this system over a traditional dice-based system is, of course, that you have more control and less RNG. The game definitely has some luck-based elements in it, no doubt about that, but they have gone some way to mitigate some of that, and one of the ways they've done that is by allowing you to control your movement. And this is key in terms of decision-making and strategy, because if you use a card to move, you can't use its effect. So each of these cards interacts with a particular space on the board and you're going to notice a little floating gold card in the middle of the screen right there right next to that bag of money the house the kind of large house shaped thing that means that this card is used on that spot so i have to move to that square and then i can use this card and it's going to have an effect if i click this button it's going to show you all these effects here so if i go and use an honest exchange on this area right here, the marketplace, I can look at the cards of an opponent, swap any number of my cards with the same number of the opponent's cards, and the opponent has to pay me 30 gold for every card swapped. So that's a cool little card. There are cards that give straight up benefits. For instance, if I play Kingpin on the prison, which I can't do now because you have to move before that, which is a little unfortunate, but there you go. I gain three votes and 100 gold. So, very thematic. You know, it's like, hey, I'm in prison, but I have established my power as the Gremlin Kingpin, and as a result, I'm going to gain political influence and gold. If I go here to the Inferno, I could play the Dangerous Artifact, which is going to give me five victory points. This is, you see right here, this number? That is how you win, basically. At the end of the set of rounds, the person with the most victory points wins. So, I, I gain five just by playing this, but I also gain Malice. Malice is a negative resource. You'll see these resources over here. Malice means that you're going to be charged more every time you pass through a so-called bribe square or circle. These are circles. I am not good at shapes. These are circles. These are bribes. Every time you move through it, almost, almost like um, pass and go in Monopoly, every time you move through this circle, not a square, you are charged a bribery fee. Yeah, because you've got to pay your bribes, you're corrupt. Capitalist gremlin, you're a horrible, horrible thing. So these are squares that will constantly drain your resource, and there are a few squares like that. For instance, if you move through this square, this gives you a misfortune. When you stop on the spot, though, you get to choose an opponent, and you can choose a misfortune. At least they can choose a misfortune, and you get that misfortune. There's a couple of typos in this game, if you notice. Miss 14? Yeah, there's a couple of different things they need to fix here. So there's a lot of these circles that do bad things, but you got to pass through them to get to the good stuff. So what can I do? All right, let's move and let's show you what happens. So 
I'm going to play this card. This is impeachment. I'm going to use it as a movement card. I'm going to use it to move two to move on to this gambling circle. And now I may choose to gamble. I move through an income circle, which gave me some money here. And there's ways to increase the amount of money you can get from that. And if you land on it, you get double. So shall we roll a dice? Yeah, let's take a risk. Why not? Here we go. And I get six. Excellent. I get 100 gold. Fantastic. So a great start for me. And now, of course, it's the next person's turn. So the AI is going to do that. Now, what's cool is that down the bottom of the screen here, it actually logs everything that the other players do. So if I want to go back in time and find out, oh, what the hell happened? What card did he play? Okay, I click this. He played the Astral Elevator. So I now know that he does not have this card anymore because he's got rid of it. So this logging system is really helpful for understanding the different plays and also the strategies of what's going on okay so the engineer over here he advocated rebellion which has actually given him eight votes now votes allow you to eventually become the governor the governor has a lot of different powers the governor does not have to pay bribes the governor does not get investigated by the police the governor can take any bribes as his own if he does so in time, it's almost like uh, rent in Monopoly. You've got to do it on the turn that the bribe is paid and you can take that money, but it increases your malice and malice, as I said, is a negative resource. Bad things happen. So if you look at this, we need to, I, I do wish that this would stop popping up. I need to turn that off. But if we look at this, we'll see the card that the player played. He played Advocating Rebellion. He had to play this on a circle that has a little uh, horn there. So he did that. Roll the dice. If you're all one, two and three, you're arrested. It gives him eight votes. So that's really, really good. But also know how powerful this card is. It's not only got a powerful effect, but it also has a very high dice roll on it. You'll notice the more powerful cards generally have more dice available. And that's pretty awesome because it means that you have to go out of your way to potentially sacrifice really powerful cards in order to actually move as far as you want to move. Well, that wasn't good. I passed through a misfortune square. I have to pay 150 gold in fines. I get about 60 of that back because I landed on an income circle. They're not squares, you idiot. What? The, are you blind? Jeez. But that's how the game works. You are going to... Oh, they put me in jail. Ah. We roll the dice and find out what's going on in jail here. I'm going to be staying in jail for three turns. Thankfully, unlike Monopoly, stuff actually happens to you in jail. You don't just sit there. You have to actually choose how you're going to behave in jail. You can actually gain jail experience, which means if you go to jail a lot, you can actually make money while you're in jail, which is a pretty cool little feature and also very thematic. The whole idea is these are corrupt capitalist gremlins. They're awful. And everything you're doing is skeezy. Everything you're doing is corrupt, suspicious, criminal indeed. And here it is. I'm actually, this is actually good for me. And, of course, they had no idea. These AI guys had no idea that this would actually benefit me. But I'm in jail. I can play Kingpin now. So I gain 100 gold and three votes. And now I can choose a behavior. Do I want to get out of quick? Or do I want to do things that are going to give me resources? I want to go out quick, so I'm going to behave. And I choose a jail card. I'm free! Amnesty. Wonderful. And out I go. So there's definitely a little bit of luck. You know, you're drawing from different decks. You have your hand of six cards. These are the chaos cards I was talking about, by the way. And they give access to incredibly powerful abilities, but they also cost a lot. Some of these cards, as you have probably noticed, have a cost to them. So if I was, say, in the dump, which is over here, and I played a gadget, well, I've got to spend 80 gold to play it, but it rewards me with three victory points. Okay, I need to get the hell out of here. Do I want to burn a most useful apparatus? Or apparatus? Hmm, that's six movement points. But, I don't know, it's very powerful. That could give me eight victory points, but it's all the way over there. And you might have noticed on these little roots here, they have arrows, so you can only go in specific directions. So that's actually an element of strategy. It allows you to plan your turns, and being able to get to the right part of the board is very important. You'll probably also notice that it, this card right here activates all the way over there which is actually very far because you can't go this way to get there. I could, however, go around this way. So this is where the planning comes in. I've got to think, you know, look, in a couple of turns, I am probably going to need some of this stuff. So I've got to think about that. All right, what should we do? Well, let's use the automated bureaucrat and we're going to move forward. And we're going to go into the gambling square again. We're going to roll on it. There we go. Ah... Misfortune. Thankfully, it was just a tiny little misfortune, a small, small donation, so we don't lose too much there. That's cool. So hopefully you get the idea. You know, there is actually quite a lot of strategy in it, even though there is definitely some RNG, no doubt about that. You can use these cards to screw over other players, and a lot of the strategy is trying to figure out what is he, 
what is this other guy trying to do here? Does he have a really great combo of cards? Is he saving up the resources to pull off some big coup? And you can screw with them. You can. You can play cards that will force them to move different squares. You can put them in jail. You can try and steal their resources so they can't play one of those big, powerful cards. Remember what I was talking about earlier right there with the most ha helpful apparatus? Well, appar Is it apparatus or apparatus? I think it's apparatus in the UK. Apparatus in the US. Anyway, this card costs 550 gold. If I don't have that, this card is useless. But I think I can gather that by that point. If someone figures out what I'm doing, they can screw with me. So there is definite strategy. This is not... You know, running around like Monopoly. Okay, we have an interesting possibility here. I could actually get into a fight with this guy, and I can spend more money to send him to jail, but I don't want to spend my money right now. What I want to do is move further than three. Hmm. Tricky. I don't really have a card that can do that, but I could use a fraudulent transaction here to move forward one. Alternatively, I can move forward three. Hmm, what do I want to do? I don't want to get into a fight. I'm going to move forward one. It sucks because I'm landing the Misfortune Square and someone is going to choose my Misfortune. <coughs> it's worth bearing in mind, of course, that if you're playing with real people, you might want to maybe ally with somebody. You might want to say, look, you know, don't screw with me. I won't screw with you and we can fight it out towards the end. Maybe this guy's too far ahead. We can do something about that. So there's a little element of social interaction. And I've got to say that a lot of digital board games particularly something like the Witcher adventure games, suffer from a lack of player interaction, which means that really you might as well not be playing multiplayer at all. That's a key problem, not only with digital board games, but with just board games in general. Quite a few of them fall into this particular trap and you've got to be just a little bit careful not to. Thankfully, this game understands that player interaction is important for fun. I'm going to get fined here. Uh, actually, no. Uh... I don't know. Uh, we, yeah, it looks like. All right, I'm going to use an honest exchange. I could land directly on that. I kind of want to go in that direction, but I also don't want to get fined. So you know what? I'm going to land on the income spot. And that's going to take me around a little longer route, but it also lets me go to the Inferno and maybe get some cash there. So I appreciate that. You just, you're noting that there are a lot of things here that board game conversions to digital devices could really use. There's a lot of that going on right now, particularly on iOS, because they realize that a lot of people want to play board games on the go, so they're willing to buy them. But a lot of the implementations are a little bit lackluster. The advantage with designing a board game from the ground up for PC, I suppose, is that you take all these features into account. You have things like the logging and the tooltips, the hover over stuff, the ability to do all of that, the indicators as to where you can move. All of these little convenience features that are very admirable, I have to say. So I dig it, no doubt. Do I have any criticisms of it? You know, a lot of them are really quite minor. I just enjoy the game a great deal because to me, it's kind of a perfect mix of that enjoy the ride style gameplay with some actual strategy, really hiding different cards from people, screwing with everybody else. And it all ties in so wonderfully with this theme. I think art style wise, it's really well designed. I, I love the art style to this. It's it's cute, it's funny, it's a little bit sinister. It's got that steampunk vibe to it, which fits perfectly. And the criticisms I have are just so minor. I talked about a lot of them earlier. And gameplay wise, it's hard for me to identify something that I really truly hate about the gameplay because I think that a lot of it is down to just a lack of experience and not really playing enough of the game to truly get it, I suppose. Ooh, this is an interest. Aha! All right, we've got a solution here. I am going to use framed, and this is a pretty cool combo here. I'm going to move three squares. I revealed my cards, but it's AI players. Who cares? Choose an opponent. You can look at it. There we go. This obviously matters in a, in a true multiplayer game. Now, I can play the police dirigible, which is quite literally an airship, to teleport to the office. Here we go. Which is going to get me much closer to my goal here. I could play a card here. I'm going to play promotion, which gives me a vote. And I'm going to sell one of my votes because I'm a corrupt gremlin bastard. And that puts me near this, the factory right here pretty cool. I think I may have accidentally used my factory card. Either that or someone stole my factory card. I think they actually might have stole it because I don't recall using it, but I may also be an absolute moron. It's entirely possible that I might have wasted that card. I have a feeling that it was stolen, which is a bit unfortunate. But hey, you know, I made some money here. I made some votes. I'm cashing in. I'm trying to set up and 
really, you know, get some victory points on the board. Outside of the stuff that I said earlier in regards to the lack of private lobbies and the lack of music in the game and things like that, the biggest kind of problem that I have with the gameplay, which I think may very well just be because we weren't playing it right, is that the whole idea of jail experience, which seems like an interesting little progression path, I found that really you don't actually want to spend that much time in jail. You can't really do much. I think it only seems to work well in longer games. I could be entirely wrong. I will say that. I could be completely wrong on this, but it does sort of seem to me like you don't want to be in jail under any circumstances, and that jail experience system as a result sort of feels a little... I wouldn't say unnecessary, or it's almost like padding. Maybe it's like a little bit underdeveloped, but I, I really do genuinely think that a lot of that comes down to the fact that I just haven't played enough, and I've also been playing 30-round games. The thing is, in 30-round games, which are the shortest games, absolutely every turn matters. So you don't want to be spending turns in jail, but in longer games, I think that the jail mechanic probably works a lot better. So it's, it's just a minor little gripe about the gameplay. Outside of that, Ooh, do I want to pay? I'm going to have to pay. I don't want to lose the votes here. Outside of that, I really think that the game plays very, very well. And whether or not you're going to enjoy it is going to be down to, do you have friends to play with? Are you willing to play the multiplayer? Are you willing to tolerate the turn length, for instance? Are you willing to tolerate that it's always online? And what is your tolerance for RNG? I don't think that this is the worst game by any stretch of the imagination when it comes to RNG. No, not, not even close. I think there are plenty of board games, both digital and real, that do RNG much, much worse. Taking a bit of a risk here. There we go. Got 10 gold from digging through the junk pile. There we go. You know, it's a bit of a risk because if you get caught doing it, you lose votes and popularity, so you don't want that. I like the way that there are just so many different intertwining systems in this game that give it that level of complexity. Do you want to pursue being very rich to go for a late game payoff? Do you want to just simply build up as many votes as possible? Do you want to become the governor? Do you want to force the election? Do you want to screw with everybody else by removing their cards or throwing them in jail? What pace do you want to go for? You've got to plan ahead as to your different movements. And these cards allow you to move with more control than a dice-driven game would. And as a result, the game has more decision making in it and less RNG. But it's got just that little just that little amount of RNG that keeps things interesting. The game has a large variety of cards available, so the games feel different every time. And I, I do think you need an element of that to keep people playing. All right, where do I want to go? Mm, I think I, I'd love to land and, and commit a touching speech because I want to pursue the governorship here, but I don't think it's going to happen. So I'm going to use that and instead I'm just going to throw myself in this direction. I'm going to land on Gamble so that I can use my bag of money next turn, which is going to give me a bunch of votes and also reduce my malice. Let's gamble. Here we go. I have a little gremlin at the top here. Just a nice little addition of art style. We lost some votes and we gained some malice, which is unfortunate. So would I recommend it? Yeah, absolutely. We had a blast playing this on stream. And I think that the multiplayer system, even if you don't have a lot of friends to play with on a regular basis, is still strong enough to allow you to play it. It even has these little emoticons and stuff like that, which I truly love. Oh, snap elections. He's got elected and he gets a nice little gold portrait. I can, uh, you can put out these little gnomish emoticons, which is a really cool way to communicate, actually. You use preset messages. So chat, as far as I know, there is no chat in the game, which to some people is go definitely going to be a downside. I still think it's obviously better to play with friends, but they've gone down the sort of Hearthstone route of we don't want people shouting each other over chat. To be fair, I, I think that that should be an option. I think you should be able to either enable or disable chat in your lobby depending on your level of tolerance. Because sometimes you want to talk to these people, you know, it's a good way to make friends potentially. Of course, you could talk over Steam messages, but it's it's not quite the same thing. You know, having an in-game system that is optional, I think, would be good. I don't think necessarily forcing the good old Hearthstone thing of, we don't want toxicity, so we don't let you talk at all because we don't trust you, is necessarily the right way to go in a board game like this. For Hearthstone, sure, why not? You know, I'm okay with that, but I think that for a game like this, uh, having a bit more communication as an option would certainly be good. Do I want to sell a victory point for money? Yeah, sure, why not? There's a, there's a lot going on here. It's a lot easier to learn than it looks. The tutorials are solid, and it's just a really well-designed little digital board game for $15. I don't have a lot of bad things to say about it. Board games are, needless to say, niche. I mean, there's no real doubt about that. 
So you're going to be telling me, ah, I don't like board games. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to blame you. I'm more of a board game player than a lot of people are. I find, indeed, as I get older, that I find these slower-paced board games to be quite interesting and the social interaction involved when playing with my friends to be a very satisfying experience. A lot of people are not going to be into that. Board games are niche. But I'm really glad that they're starting to develop board game style titles with good multiplayer as independent projects for PC. Because I think that actually there's a market for them. We're going to be behaving badly. What do we get? I'm a bully. I'm a horrible bully. I punched a gremlin in the face. And that's cool because I gained experience, but I also gained malice. So there you go. It is Gremlins Incorporated, ladies and gentlemen. $15 available on Steam or your regional equivalent. If you want to see more of this game played with actual people, go watch the Co-optional Lounge episode available on my channel where myself, Cry, Dodger, and Strip and play this game. We had a blast. Thank you very much for watching, folks. If you enjoyed this video, then by all means, feel free to click the like button on the screen right there. If you disliked it, if you're a horrible, corrupt, capitalist gremlin that wishes me nothing but harm. Dislike works, I suppose. I'll see you next time.